Hey, deserving listeners, the trial. Let's watch. It, 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 it was it was impossibility. So, what do you do? You accept her vernacular. You accept what the word that she uses, and then you use that word to to uh, placate her, so that it would at least calm part of the part of the aggression. It would it would lessen the uh, attacks. So explaining the monster was for me. I mean, she, 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 she had told me many times that the monster was only me when I was uh, using drugs and, and, and alcohol. Okay, well, one, if he was using and was using opiates and or drinking or I guess particularly drinking, he might exhibit aggression and hostility that he never would otherwise. So going down that road, that could be that he doesn't remember or wants to minimize that he actually was aggressive and hostile in an unfair way, maybe even abusive while he was drunk, or he would actually assert himself more when he was drunk. So I don't know, but victims who are ongoing victims of abuse might, when they're intoxicated on alcohol in particular, actually let out all of their anger that they've been stuffing the whole time because they no longer feel afraid because they're uninhibited because of the alcohol intoxication or their executive function is compromised such that they aren't conceiving of the consequences of actually speaking their mind. The other possibility is what I was talking about earlier is that for Amber, who knows, but I could, I could see this happening for someone with borderline is they are, you know, in light of what I was saying earlier, the black and white thinking, good breast, bad breast, if you will, Melanie Klein, her words, uh, that when you're in love with someone and it's idealization, it's like, you're wonderful, you're wonderful, you're wonderful. I'm starting to see this other side of my partner that I don't like. I can't really hold that all together in one person, so I have to compartmentalize it. What could I blame? Remember I said earlier, it's like, you know, you look for it, you must, someone must be influencing you and one of the things available to Amber potentially would be drug use. It's like, well, this must be, this must be your drug use. And if he's using more and more over time to cope with the abuse, then it's an easy scapegoat. It's not you because I need you to be perfect and ideal and a safe place for me to pour all of my hopes and dreams of finally having a secure relationship into. So if you give any, me any pushback or there's any, or there's something rejecting about you, it must be the drugs and alcohol. So I could see that. Even when I was uh, stone cold sober off of alcohol and uh, s substances aside from my meds, the term the monster was still there. I will say that he was prescribed Xanax and psychostimulant for presumably ADHD, I don't know. But with Xanax, if you take it frequently, you can have memory problems. So there's that. I don't know if that's the situation, but that often can happen. Also, if you take Xanax frequently, you can be intoxicated in a way that you don't actually know you're intoxicated. I, I've taken Xanax and Valium, both benzodiazepine, prescribed by my dentist, actually, because I had this pretty severe, well, not, I mean, to anyone else, it wouldn't be that big of a deal, but to me, it was a big deal. I would describe it in gory detail, but there were, a, let's just say there was a drill involved for a half an hour into my jawbone, <laughs> various drill bit size. And, you know, uh, particularly back when I had this procedure like 10 years ago, I there's no way I would have been able to deal with that given my anxiety. And my dentist who also has dental anxiety said, here's what I do, take you know this amount of Valium the night before and this amount of Valium just before and you should be okay. And I was okay. <laughs> I, was, I was chilling and I thought, uh, how am I getting through? Like, I'm totally just chill. But I didn't feel drunk. But my wife was with me and said, uh, oh, yeah, you were, uh, you were loopy. You're a little weird, you know? So you can be intoxicated on benzodiazepines. Now, if you're taking it all the time and it's the same pill every day, same time, it's not likely to happen. But it could. And that could affect everything that's being said here. His memory, he could become irritable sometimes if he is low on that substance because you you can become 
dependent on that substance and your brain can be affected by when you take the pill, all that kind of stuff. So I don't know. There's no data of any of that, but I just wanted to throw that out there. When I hear him on a prescription benzodiazepine, oftentimes what that means is the person is literally taking it every day. Uh, accused, be, accused me of being uh, high on cocaine or drinking like, like, like I was a, you know, some kind of 19th century sailor. It's, uh, that, that, that was the word she clung to to describe, but um, it was in her mind, not mine. How did your relationship with Ms. Hurd affect your substance use? For example, w when we were on the road, you know, when you're traveling, from, uh, if you're on a press tour, or if you're making a film and you're staying in a hotels or this or that, I would always have to get a different, or we would always have to book an extra room that I was able to escape to, so I didn't have to lock myself in another bathroom. It breaks you down. The constant haranguing breaks you down. You know, there's a part of you that says, listen, if I'm going to be accused of this, I might as well just do it. Yeah, and that's unfortunate that that would happen. That's one of the things that we work on with people who suffer from addiction is that attitude of, well, if you think of me as a loser and an addict, then fine, I'll be a loser and, and an addict. And that is one of the coping styles to being verbally abused or criticized or harmed. When we have those chronic experiences, we can either surrender, avoid, or overcompensate. Now, there's a whole other way of dealing with it, which is try to heal from the whole thing, which I guess is a fourth way of dealing with it. But to surrender is to give in. So another example is if you're told that you're a loser and you're incompetent and you don't, you'll never amount to anything, one of the ways of coping with it, because it gets into your head, the way to cope with that schema is to say, okay, I guess I, I will just be that. Because one, it feels like, well, I might as well, why try to get out of it? Because, you know, I, I'm, everyone else is convinced I'm a loser, so I might as well be that way. Another motivation is, well, at least I can say that I participated in my own self-destruction, you know? If I did try and fail, then it'll hurt even more. So I'll just say, you know what, fine, I'm a loser, I'm an addict, and I choose that. But yes, I get it, I'm a loser. But yes, but I, I, I also in choosing that, so at least I'm not that much of a loser because I never try, you know? So when people are being, are suffering from addiction and they're being told that they're a loser and an addict, even when they're trying not to use, then that can cause that surrender schema uh, behavior, which is unfortunate. But the other thing that we will work on with people that suffer from addiction that will talk this way is you are just using someone else as an excuse for you for your own use the addict mind if you will is looking for any excuse to capitalize on the situation and, and get you to use just because someone's convinced that you're using or is accusing you of being a drunk or a, what you, a junkie then your addict mind just uses that as an excuse because it's always looking for something anyway so you can't blame your use on someone else you have to take responsibility yourself there's a kind of a fuzzy though zone there and uh, certainly if you're being abused and you have no way out we wouldn't or I wouldn't look at a situation like that and say that the drug use is you know completely 100% that victim's responsibility but I just want to throw that out there because I'm sure people in recovery when they hear something like that being said depending on what sort of recovery you're in they would say oh Johnny Depp you're not supposed to say that <laughs> like you can't blame your use on someone else it never exceeded it, it never my substance abuse or use the alcohol that I uh, used or drank uh, was again purely it's it's that little boy who didn't want to hear or didn't want to feel the pain of his uh, mother turning him into some kind of ball of insecurity and yeah I, I believe him I, I, I believe that that is the motivation for him to use people who use substances a lot and are in touch with their trauma will often be very aware that yeah i don't drink to have fun i don't drink to socialize i drink to numb the voices in my head from when i was a child and i was being told or treated in a certain way and and it works you know so there's that but i also think that he's kind of downplaying his use i mean I, I don't know the details but i think he I think, to me, he would be more convincing overall, I'm not on the jury, if he were to say something along the lines of, well, 
I, I do have a problem with substances that is completely independent of Amber Heard, but she, Amber Heard made it worse in this way. But I don't want to blame all my use on her, and, and there were times when I overused. The claims that I was abusive during that time is false. Might I have been a, more aggressive at times? Yeah, but it was rare. You know, I, I would, if you said something like that, I would think, oh, okay. But we're not hearing any uh, mention of how he would drink because of him and it was independent of Amber. How, well, I guess he just said that he would because, you know, the insecurity. But he, I don't know, he's not emphasizing it very much. And, you know, maybe, maybe he will eventually. He said the words to me because I wanted to know. I wanted to know. Am I, am I an alcoholic? Am I an alcoholic? Or is this just the same thing that I did as a kid when I took my mom's nerve pill? Okay, so we actually don't have a clinical definition for alcoholism. You might be surprised by that, but we have definitions in the DSM for substance abuse. People will often talk that way. It's like, am I, not, am I an alcoholic? Am I not? And I suppose if you map it on to alcohol use disorder, then the main criterion is, is your use ruining your life or affecting your life negatively? That's a hard thing to evaluate, it, especially if you're asking the individual to report on the ways in which alcohol is affecting their life negatively. I mean, you could argue that everyone who drinks has been negatively affected by their drinking, right? Now, in the DSM, there are other criteria. Of course, that's not the only criterion. There are several others. But generally speaking, that's the core of it. Because you could, for example, I guess, by definition, drink a lot on the weekend. And from the outside, it might look like alcoholism. But if your life isn't affected by that, then you don't really fit criteria. Now, if you're drinking a lot and it looks like alcoholism, it probably is because it probably is affecting the individual. At the very least, it's harming their health, right? So, but it's hard to gauge. Now, people who have problems typically will present in very, very similar ways. So I'm not saying that it's ambiguous or hard to detect. When I have someone with a substance use problem or any kind of addiction, it's very easy for me to gauge pretty quickly, actually, as long as they're being honest with me, where they are on a spectrum of compulsive problem. So we're hearing from him that he has heard from multiple chemical dependency treatment professionals telling him that he, I think he's going to say that even though he drinks a lot, he's not an alcoholic. And that sounds suspect to me. I can't, one, even the rumors that I've heard of him using and, and of his own, I mean, he, he has already talked about how throughout his life he has used substances to numb out. That is a classic major criterion for substance use disorder or for generally speaking, a compulsive chemical dependency. So I, I don't know where he's going with this, but I think he's about to say something that a lot of people who suffer from addiction will say pre-awareness and pre-recovery that I've got it all in control. It's fine. There's nothing wrong. Yeah, sure. I, yeah, I drink, you know, and I use several drugs and opiates and sure, you know, I, I need benzos to get through the day. Oh yeah. yeah and sure. You know, I, I need a stimulant to make sure that I wake up and, you know, sh and I'm not accusing Johnny, the, the stimulants could be absolutely medically necessary. The, the, the benzodiazepine could be medically necessary, but it's not uncommon for people who are suffering from addiction to be in this state of mind. And they believe it because it if they don't believe this, then they have to face the fact that they have a problem, which means it threatens their use, which is extremely threatening to them. If they can't have that coping mechanism of using, then they feel like they might as well just walk off a cliff at this point, because how in the world are they supposed to survive without that? And of course, he's already said those things, and he's been using substances since he was, since he was 11 years old to cope with his emotions. So, you know, to be completely sober, might be almost impossible for him. Now, he's claimed that he's gone for periods of time of sobriety, so that could be true, but I don't know. 
I'm not convinced. <laughs> and you chemical dependency people out there, I'm sure as you watch this, you're like, eh, Johnny, I, I don't. Like again, it, as I was saying earlier, it would be much more believable. And he could be telling the truth. And what do I know? But I would, I would much more believe him if he said, yeah, I got a problem. And I can't cope with my emotions without substances. It's a problem. I, I've, I've gone to a lot of therapy. I've tried. I'm getting better. But I still s- struggle. And one could argue that my use of other prescription substances, although medically necessary, might be kind of wrapped up in, in that safety blanket for me that I that I feel like I need, given my traumas. Yeah, I, I have a problem, and all that's true. I never abused Amber Heard, you know, like, but I think he's about to say that his therapists have told him that he doesn't have a problem with something. Now, there's a possibility that non-chemical dependency therapists that didn't know what they were talking about uh, either uh, placated him or literally believed that they could evaluate this sort of thing and just said, no, I don't think you have a problem. You know, it's okay to have a drink now and then. What's wrong with that? Do I have a drinking problem? It essentially came down to this. Do you have a drinking problem, Johnny? Objection. Calls for hearsay. How often would Miss Heard drink in your presence? While you were in a relationship? Always. Well, Miss Heard drank a... She took a shine to a very nice Spanish wine called Vega Cecilia. She and all her friends did. Yeah, the wine would, would come out and uh, Miss Heard could uh, very easily drink two bottles of wine per night. Well, not a not a problem. Okay, so we're hearing from him that she drank frequently. There were other reports from others saying similar things. The assistant, the others I can't remember but he is saying that she could drink a couple bottles of wine in one night no problem yeah that's a that's a lot of alcohol if you have a high tolerance if you don't mind being extremely intoxicated then that's not uncommon you know to happen now is he just saying that and he you know it happened once or twice and he's saying it happened he's implying it happened much more often than it actually did. I don't know. And I will say that people who suffer from severe attachment, threats, and insecurity will often turn to substances to cope in the same way that I think Johnny Depp did. What I found strange was when I did did get sober from, from the, uh, well, I was off the, the opiates that I, had, that I had been addicted to prior, prior to a year or so before, a couple of years before. She asked me if I would stop drinking to save the relationship, of course, and I stopped drinking. I always found it odd that, in support of me not drinking, that she might stop drinking, uh, but she did not. She- All right, who knows, a little bit of detail, but we're hearing from his account that at some point she asked that he stop drinking to save their relationship. That should tell us something potentially about his drinking. Usually people who are confronted in that way they usually have at least some level of a problem and i don't know if he's saying he doesn't have a problem so i don't want to put words in his mouth but but yeah and he's saying that he did quit and that amber he thought amber would also quit which is you know customary for sure but not everyone's going to do that but apparently she did not now she might claim look he would drink all day long all the time and he was heavily intoxicated and the demon monster would come out during that time and i was at my wits end and i said you got to stop drinking and i pleaded pleaded with him several times he fought with me about it he finally quit drinking and he wasn't happy about it but i was happy to see him not drinking because i thought maybe our relationship would get back on track and yeah sure when my sister had a birthday party i would drink and come home and I guess he might have known that I was drinking or I guess maybe it was a little insensitive to me uh, about for me to when my friends came over we'd be by the pool and we'd have some drinks I don't know I just didn't want to ruin my social life but I guess looking back maybe it, it was a bad thing that I did that or are we seeing a situation where she's just like control I don't care about you I guess we'll probably never know but you can make your call about that the, to- you know, the glass came up to toast and I, and I just, in my head, I thought, it's just champagne, you know, a little bit tink to toast Christopher in his Lifetime Achievement Award. And so I've had half a glass of champagne with Christopher Lee and his wife. Um, after that, immediately after that award ceremony, um, I went to pick up Miss Heard and uh, take her to dinner um, uh, at a restaurant. And I told her that I'd had a half a glass of champagne with 
Christopher. And I thought, listen, it, it, it's, it's not like, you know, you're sitting in a pub guzzling pints of snake bites or... All right, so he's saying that during his 18 months of sobriety from opiates and alcohol, and I was wondering what he meant by that because he would just say he was sober, but because the main things would be the alcohol and the opiates. And he is saying also that he's been, he's currently sober. And I have no reason to disbelieve him, but I don't know. I guess I've been around the block enough times to know that people with addictions will lie or lie to themselves or minimize or leave stuff out. And, you know, I'm not judging him. I'm not shaming him, of course, but I just have to say what's going on in my mind. I'm just like, well, I, I don't know. Or he's in court. He's just trying to portray a certain way. But anyway, he's talking about a story that when he was still with Amber, that he went to an event giving Christopher Lee a, you know, Saruman, right? Christopher Lee is he Saruman? And, and many other roles, obviously. And that he, there was a ceremony that he presented the award for Christopher Lee and there was champagne and toasting. And he felt like, well, it'd be weird if I didn't drink a little bit of this. So he drank a little bit of it, just a half glass of champagne. And if it's a regular champagne glass, like, you know, it's, it's not that much alcohol by content. But now if I were his sponsor, I would say, you know, you shouldn't be doing that, right? <laughs> like it's a slippery slope. It's not a guarantee, but you know, once that alcohol, even a little bit like that hits the brain or the door is ajar a little bit, it's going to be hard to close that door back up again. So you you could have just not drank it. You could have said that you didn't feel well, or you could have literally said, I'm a recovering alcoholic. That's the best thing you should do because that's the best thing to protect you from these kinds of events and just say, sorry, can't drink, recovering alcoholic. I'll toast, but, you know, sorry, I can't drink, but congratulations and, you know, whatever. But he's claiming that it wasn't a big deal, and he goes back to Amber and discloses that, and he's like, it's not a big deal to her, and apparently she reacted. Guinness were doing shots of Jägermeister, or at that point it wasn't even for need to bury feelings or emotions. It was literally a joyous occasion for Christopher, and I said to her, I, I, I enjoyed it. You know, It gave me the opportunity to enjoy the, the actual champagne, the, 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 the drink. And, the, and my appreciation for wine and winemaking and that I've been fascinated with for years and years. And I saw nothing wrong in it. And I said, I'd, I'd like to have a glass of champagne. And she was sitting there with a glass of wine. Well, I didn't know it was headed there. So I don't know. But if he does have a problem with substances and you were married to him and you saw the downside of his use to his body, to his mood, to his work, to his productivity, to him embarrassing himself, all sorts of problems. And you fight, 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 fight for him to realize that he has a problem, for him to get sober. He finally gets sober, but he's not really invested in recovery. There's a situation where you could argue he could have he could have said, I can't drink this, or he could have just put it up to his lips and put it back, but he decided to take a little bit of that drink I don't know, but if you were my client, I would assume that was his addict side saying like, well, you can't turn it down. It would be impolite to do so. It's just a classic slippery slope first move from people who suffer from addiction. This is, it's always these little things. And this is why when you're in full recovery, you announce as soon as you walk into a room, recovered alcoholic here, recovering addict, don't offer me anything. Like you, you put it out there um, and then it's in the room, you don't hide, you're not ashamed of yourself, and people know to not do that, or if they do, you'd be like, remember I just said that, so you know, you're know you doing something that I clearly said don't do. And pre-full recovery from addiction, you're not there yet because there's still that strong addict mind that's like, well, but I, what if, you know? And it knows, you could argue, that if you slam the door shut, then you're never going to be able to use again. So you always want to keep it ajar a little bit. And that's how it gets you. But anyway, so we're hearing that. And I don't know about John. Yeah, I'm not saying anything about him. But if I heard that story in a client, I, I would go down a road of, and they were asking me help with their addiction. I, I would really drill down on that and 
probably confront them on that because that's what they're asking me to do. If they want, if they want me to help them with their recovery, these are those moments. <laughs> you know, I'd literally, I would literally say something like, "Look, I'm sorry, but you literally pay me for the goal of helping you to attain sobriety because that's what you came in for." And I, I just have to say, you you did something that really threatens your sobriety, one, just by having that little bit of champagne. Now, I'm not gonna say that I'm an abstinence only person. There are people who can certainly use in moderation and have it not be that much of a problem. But I am hearing a lot of things from Johnny Depp himself that are a lot of red flags of someone who probably needs to be completely sober in order for his life to be manageable. Anyway, so then he, meets up with Amber Heard after having the half glass of champagne and he is like, look, it's not a big deal. I actually enjoyed. And I, I again, I don't know about Johnny, but I, I will hear people that suffer from addiction. They'll say like, hey, you know what? I just had half a glass of champagne and I'm okay. My life isn't falling apart. Everything's fine. You know, maybe champagne, you know, because champagne, you know, you could see someone think this because normally I drink wine, which, you know, you just tend to guzzle wine. This is the way they think. And then with champagne though, you enjoy, you know, you sip it, you, you know, you're not gonna guzzle a bunch of champagne, of course some people do, but you could see someone, an addict voice saying, look, it's just champagne, maybe that's the answer. You can have the alcohol, you're not gonna, bit. you've never binged on champagne, you don't know anyone who's binged on champagne, it'll be fine. It's totally different, even though it's not any different. It's the same molecule that enters the brain. So then he goes to Amber and says, you look, I'm going to have a glass of champagne because I think I'm ready, that kind of thing. And if I'm reading the situation right, Amber Heard's like, oh, no, 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 no. You have a big problem with alcohol. We're not going back there. Don't do this to me. You know, no, this is bad. <laughs> I know you when you get drunk. That's one way of looking at it. Another way is I'm a controlling person and I'm distorted about you and everything about you, including your drinking. And so I'm going to freak out over nothing. I don't know. You make the call. And she, we were in the restaurant, and she absolutely lost it and got up and stormed to the ladies' room. And I told my security and driver, I said, uh, I think we have to go. I think we're have to now, I will say that if you're ever in that situation, the, w the way I was describing it, I don't know if it's accurate to this, but if you have a partner or a family member who suffers from addiction and you work really, really hard to help them to get sober, and then they show up one day think you know out of the blue they're like i think i'm ready to drink and you're like uh, what <laughs> how do you possibly think that you're okay to drink given all that we've been through with your drinking the way to respond there's a lot of ways to respond to get livid and walk away is one reaction but there are many others now it's possible that he's leaving stuff out like he she said it's nicely like hey no why don't please please. And he was like, ah, you're trying to control me. And then, you know, back and forth, back and forth. She, she's like, well, I'm not going to be here if you're going to drink. So I'm out of here. You know, who knows? But oh, the way to communicate, because often recovery depends on how the support system and particularly the spouse reacts to relapse. And uh, it's not your fault as a partner, of course, but you are a major factor in helping them. And one of the ways to respond would be, well, look, and this is what I would do if I were in that situation. I would say, if you want to drink a glass of champagne, that's up to you. It, I'm, I'm not your mom, but I will say that when I hear that, it terrifies me because I know what it was like before. And I know that you think it's not going to be a problem, but you know, your sponsor, I don't think he has a sponsor, but what I've understood about substance use is that it can get out of control and maybe it won't for you, but I have to say it terrifies me. And I will say I'm kind of hurt because I've we've talked a lot about how your drinking affected me. And for you to consider drinking, I know you don't mean it this way, but it hurts my feelings because it feels like you're willing to take a chance on returning to the way things were before. And and I'm also worried because you're not in a 12-step program. You're not going every day to AA. You're not doing the work and that's up to you, but I'm worried about myself. I'm worried about what you do when you are drunk or how distant you get or how volatile you get or how much I feel bad for you because you're so intoxicated sometimes. And so 
that would be that. And then inside, and then, you know, the other person does what they want with it. You can have a conversation, but then you yourself have to draw boundaries. And maybe that's what Amber did. Maybe she's just like, fine, if you're going to drink, I can't be around you. And that's sometimes what is best. I believe. So we left the restaurant and uh, went home. And the mere suggestion of me sipping a glass of champagne or having one glass or two glasses of wine, she, she went apoplectic. She, 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 it was, uh, I was weak. Uh, uh, I was a complete mess. I was an alcoholic. I was, you know, I was going to uh, ruin everything. My, you know, your kids, your kids are not proud of you. They, they can't stand what you're doing. Yeah. So that would be consistent with Johnny Depp's claim of her verbal abuse. And I, I guess I should include this because it looks like there's a possibility this was happening that when you suffer from borderline, you can have a, a an additional aspect to it of codependency, which means that you feel safest when you are taking care of someone with a problem and you need that person to have a problem in order to help them. If that person doesn't have a problem, then it, it, you can't engage in that constant activity of saving someone from themselves. I'm not hearing that. I'm not hearing codependency, so let's get off that track. But there's also another, you know, way in which people with borderline will mesh well with someone with a substance abuse problem because the person with there's so many different aspects to how these two fit together. The a uh, person with borderline will subconsciously prefer someone with a substance abuse problem because that that person needs an enabler. They need someone to pick up around them, and that makes the borderline person feel more secure in this kind of pathological way because it's like, well, they can't really function without me. And also, if I have deep amount of hurt that I'm not aware of that I transform into anger and verbal abuse it's very easy for me to abuse someone with substances because they have a problem that they're already ashamed of and don't have a way of really fighting back. So I can berate them and berate them and berate them, which causes them, this is all subconscious, which causes them to use more and use more and use more, which causes me to have more you know, ammunition to berate, 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 because I have so much anger because I have so much hurt that needs to come out. So there's a possibility that's what we're seeing. And again, I, I don't blame anyone in Amber Heard's position for having a major meltdown, so to speak, when you, you've been fighting for so long to get your partner sober. They've been sober for 18 months. You've had some reprieve from the past. And then they show up at dinner and they're like, I think I'm going to start drinking again. And they don't even recognize what they're asking and what they're saying. That'd be normal to have some, some level of meltdown, but, but to berate and to put down and to say he's a terrible father, like, yeesh. So at that point I said to her, okay, listen, how about this? You want, to, you want to support me not drinking? I've never asked you this before. How about you stop drinking? How about you get sobriety and share this sobriety with me? To totally fine. But again, if when I have treated people, with this disorder, they will sometimes have these stipulations. Well, I'm not stopping drinking if my partner's not going to stop drinking because, you know, that's unfair. And I'll be like, nope, that's not how this works. Your partner might have a problem too. I don't know. But that's for them to figure out and that's for them to deal with on their own. And you can certainly have a chat with that. But your sobriety and your use is yours. And having any other perspective is the addict mind allowing you to continue to use, always having a stipulation, always having a way out of sobriety so that you can get into using again. And I wouldn't word it like that, of course, but you know, that would be the kind of gist. And uh, yeah, now again, it's totally normal if you are going through recovery to ask your community, can you not drink around me? Or best, could you just not drink at all? Like, could we all just stop because it'll help? You can ask for sure. And maybe if people refuse, you might have to draw some boundaries with them, maybe even cut them out of your life, depending on your level of, of difficulty getting sober, for sure. But to say, okay, fine, I'll stop if you stop. But if you don't stop, I'm going to drink. If Amber Heard 
sees herself as not having a problem or not as much of a problem as him, then she could be rational in saying, well, I don't, you're just kind of pinning this on me. I don't have a problem with drinking. I drink, but I don't have a problem with it. You're the one with the problem. Now, I will say, if you ever have a partner that is going through recovery and they ask you, you know, you should heavily consider also quitting for sure. And if you can't, you know, you should probably go through recovery yourself. Just because you're not as bad as your partner doesn't mean you also don't have a problem. Support me and help me through this. What did she say to that? No. No. <clears throat> she said no. She said she didn't have a problem. But I, I've never had a physical addiction to alcohol. I don't. How often have you seen Ms. Heard use other... So he says, I've never had a physical addiction to alcohol. And this is an old way of thinking that... I don't know if he possesses, but I'll just point it out that we used to think, even in our field to a large extent, that if you didn't have withdrawal symptoms, then you weren't really dependent. It was this medical model dealing with addiction. This idea that for some people who drink, they'll binge drink or they'll drink to cope and their drinking might be sporadic. They might go for a month without drinking, but then they have like a week of binge drinking or they'll go for you know, two weeks without drinking, but then they'll have like a Friday night where they just become completely out of control drunk, or they only drink every three days and it's just two glasses of wine because they're stressed out. And they don't experience any withdrawal symptoms in between use. They could stop for a month. They don't feel that physical withdrawal symptoms that people will get when they drink chronically or use opiates chronically and suddenly stop or use less. So a lot of people, again, who are in the throes of an addiction will say this sort of thing to me. They're like, well, I'm not an addict because I, you know, I can quit at any time. I, I, you know, I can drink. I don't have to drink. I, I went for a couple of weeks. I didn't drink and I didn't have a craving and it was fine. And it might be true, but often what we find is there's an overall pattern of compulsivity using to cope without any other way of coping. They are oriented towards alcohol. For, for a lot of people that don't go down a road of addiction, when they drink, it's circumstantial. It's just like, oh, okay, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll have a drink. You know, it's not on their mind. It's, it's not something that they are oriented towards. People with substance abuse problems, even when they're not using, they're oriented toward that thing because they're mind, body, and soul, or mind, body, or soul, needs that thing so much. You know, it's a compulsive itch, and, and there's a lot of thought that goes into it. She, she was always quite fond of MDMA, which is, which is ecstasy, and uh, mushrooms. She had some medications that she, 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 she was on already that were, uh, well, one in particular was quite a high velocity um, speed, if you will. Okay, so we're hearing from Johnny Depp that Amber Heard would use ecstasy and mushrooms and a stimulant. Okay. I don't know if I can say the name. Am I allowed to say the name? It doesn't that's, matter. That's not necessary. Um, what, um, how often did you see Ms. Heard take MDMA? I wonder what name. Was it crack? Because <laughs> I'm trying to think of a stimulant that he would be shy about naming. Do you, do you have a guess as to what... He was, I mean, who knows, it doesn't really matter, but I'm curious as to what he was referring to. It, it didn't happen. I, I've never struck Miss Heard. As I said yesterday, I've never struck Miss Heard. I've never struck a woman in my life. I'm certainly not going to strike a woman if she decides to make fun of a tattoo that I have on my body. It's like going in into someone's journal and picking out things you don't like. She had made mention, uh, I, there was no incident of... of, of argument when, she, when the tattoo thing has been, had been brought up many, many times, and I mean, there's really nothing I can do. My, I've always thought of my body as a, as a journal, if you will, to, to, to mark it. I wonder if they're referring to, because I, I know enough about Johnny Depp that he had a Winona tattoo in the 80s. Did he not? Because <laughs> him and Winona Ryder were a thing back in the day. I think that's what we're talking about right now, that he has these tattoos that he got in reference to his current partner. And if you have borderline, or even if you don't, you could imagine someone having a concern about that. If you look at their body and it's like, there's your ex's name on here. 
uh, for those of you who watch 90 Day Fiance with me, you know, Jasmine was triggered by paint that uh, Gino had in his apartment or house or whatever. So you've imagined that the ex's name is right on someone's body. You know, you can imagine that. But if your borderline is going to be particularly hurtful and threatening and scary. But I feel like I remember that after he broke up with Winona, he like tattooed over it with something. I don't know. I don't know what they're talking about, but I'm guessing it was something along those lines. And Amber claims that as she was criticizing him, he became violent with her. And he's saying that he was never violent with her. Experiences to mark life experiences. Is it, you know, for example, when you're. Okay, actually, I thought I'd look it up because I am genuinely curious about this tattoo. And right, he had a Winona forever, and then he had it changed to Wino forever, meaning someone who drinks wine. He had slapped Miss Heard three times after she laughed at his Wino forever tattoo when he was drinking heavily. So I guess that, that's what they're, they're talking about. Now, if he was drinking heavily, like heavily, heavily, blackout, brownout heavily, then one, he wouldn't necessarily remember what he did. Two, you're capable of doing things under extreme intoxication that you would never do otherwise. So are we looking at a situation like that? I don't know. Now, you, if you're anti-Amber, you could claim, well, she's just saying that because she knew he was drinking and she knew that she could get away with an allegation that he and he might look bad because he's alcohol because he's drinking no one can go back or no one should go back and rewrite their journals why would i take such great offense to someone making fun of a, a tattoo uh, on my body it, uh, it that, 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 that allegation never made any sense to me whatsoever what a, a tattoo that i believe is up here uh, which used to say uh, winona forever who was a former girlfriend and um we've been together for a few years um, went on a rider, and uh, when we when when we broke up, how do you fix that? I did go back and read. I have to say, as a teen in the '80s, Johnny Depp and went on a rider together. As as far as I paid attention to some things, I do remember that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't she caught shoplifting? Even though she's a millionaire, that kind of thing. And so, you know, I, I've I've speculated and I've treated people who have compulsive stealing behaviors for various different reasons. Some, you know, sometimes it, it just makes no sense as to why someone would do that. Now, I guess you could argue that since that is a part of me, that my bias could be pro Johnny because for so many years he was he was one of our guys. I, I remember watching 21 Jump Street in high school and, and, you know, thinking that Johnny Depp was the coolest, you know, and he was the center of that show. There was him and his buddy, and then Richard Grieco came on the scene. He was the he was the bad boy, <laughs> and you know, and Edward Scissorhands, and and then his eventual rise in stardom. You know, just so many things about his career early on that was a big part to my generation. So, so you know, and I have almost no knowledge of Amber Heard. The only thing that I knew about her before reacting to their audio a, a few years ago was that. She was someone with Johnny Depp, and had she been in Aquaman yet by that point? I don't know. That's, that's the only thing I can think of seeing. And, and if I saw her, I wouldn't make that connection because I, I didn't like Aquaman, and, I, and she was in makeup and all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, we, you have to consider that, right? As a therapist, for example, if they were to come into my office, which would never happen, I would have to really get a lot of consultation supervision around my very potential bias for Johnny Depp. And I'd have to really monitor that and make sure that I wasn't favoring him or believing him more or something like that. Rewrite my journal to some degree. I, I took off the last two letters and had it say Wino forever, just because I thought it was, uh, she was very encouraging um, in, in, in me getting a, um, a tattoo of, of, of her, of her name or whatever. And, uh, I waited a while, and then I yes, I did it. I got a full tattoo of her, and it uh, ironically wasn't long after that that the um, that everything started going sideways. I, I was doing anything I could to bring a smile to her face, as opposed to the frown, and then the onslaught of whatever whatever problems she 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 was seeing or experiencing. I don't know if this is accurate, but if she does have borderline and she has that type of borderline that 
can result in a lot of hostility and seeing problems that don't actually exist, which not every borderline person will manifest their disorder that way, then what Johnny Depp is describing is a common feeling, common account of being with someone like that, that you, and of abuse, right? You're in a constant state of trying to please and trying to entertain and trying to make the other person happy and always worried about around the corner at any time there's going to be some trigger that is going to happen and I'm going to get that frown and then I know what that means. It's, it's, it's going to be, I'm going to be in conflict for the next number of days and I'm going to be attacked. I'm going to have to defend myself. It's going to be awful. That sounds like what he's describing, right? I was, uh, I was filming Black, a film called Black Mass in, in, in Boston and um, Ms. Hurd had come with me. Was Miss Hurd staying with you in Boston during the entire time that you were making that film? Yes. Yes, she was. All right. Well, that does it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really, really do.